I know I was told I have early stage, but I have no idea whether it's two, a one, 1A, one 1B. One Am I supposed to be told that by the doctor? Is that in a, in a pathology report? Yeah, um, so tip, oh, is my mic, is my mic on? Yes. Can you hear me? No. Okay. Usually, usually projection's not an issue with me. I'm fairly loud. But anyway, um, you know, typically um, the conversation about 1A versus 1B disease um, comes up when you're talking about treatments. So 1A disease is less than 10% of your body surface area involved with the disease. So we kind of use the rule of palms here. So a palm would be 1%. So if you match out all of your patches or plaques and put them together, and it's less than 10%, once again, you know, that whole sort of arbitrary number, that's considered to be 1A disease. And that's where, you know, the domain of the treatments kind of fall into a lot of the skin-directed topicals. And then 1B disease is typically greater than 10% of your surface area. So it could be anything from 11% to 90%. So that 90% involvement of the skin is quite different in, in the behavior of the disease. But you're not going to get it on a pathology report. That's all based on the physical exam. And when you're talking about treatments, that's usually when that conversation comes up, at least in my experience. Parasoriasis. Oh, this is just parasoriasis. And I, I, I said, no, this is different. So he did a biopsy, but yeah. never said whether it was, and never looked at me and, or had me backed. I really. Yeah, so, so the whole. Um, he treated me topically, so I'm assuming it was just either 1A or 1B, right? So is this your current dermatologist or your previous derm pre previous practice? The most current would be July, yeah. Okay. Um, I think, uh, so staging, I, I, I mean, every CTCL specialist in your chart note will definitely write the stage. Um, so it, sometimes that doesn't come across um, in the conversation with the patient. Um, but usually, at least in my clinic, after I see them initially, we confirm the diagnosis. And before we start talking about treatments, we say, okay, this is your stage. Um, and then, you know, I answer questions about prognosis for stage or what kind of treatments for stage. So I use the term a lot. Sometimes if you get diagnosed by a, a local dermatologist, they might not use the terminology staging, okay? They might not use it explicitly. But it is true that, um, you know, early stage includes stage 1A, 1B, and 2A. And that sort of encompasses early stage. Um, so if they use the term early stage, then they may not use the actual number. Hi, my question is very closely related to that. I was very relieved to hear that 2A is still considered early stage. I Thank God I'm 1A. But I know at some point when I first got diagnosed and then when I got in with uh, Dr. Geskin after my previous dermatologist went elsewhere, um, she was mumbling something about photophoresis, and that's way beyond 1A, it seemed to me. I guess my bigger question is, we tend to think, okay, it's 1A, and maybe it'll progress, and blah, blah, blah. But does it go back down? If you're 2A, can they get you back down to 1A? That's what I really wanted to know. Yeah, so your, your stage of disease is your stage at presentation, although your stage can change over time. And um, so some patients that present with stage three or four disease, and you impose therapy, and you hopefully select the right therapy, their disease can very much behave like earlier stage disease. So we have had patients that are stage three and four disease. You select a systemic treatment oftentimes because that's what later stage disease will call upon. And once they respond, they behave more like a stage 1A or maybe a 1B disease. So... Sometimes we use clarifying terms, so your ultimate stage is your stage of diagnosis, but sometimes we use current stage or maximal stage or best stage. So those are different terms that we'll use as we follow people over the long term. Um, but when you read papers, okay, and, and literature and publications, stage means your original stage of diagnosis which is different from a lot of the other cancers. Yeah. Great. Questions, Carol. When do you 
finally decide to do a skin biopsy on a new patient. Uh, because I think what happens to people who have the MF, they've been through a pretty long time of putting these topical medications on that didn't work. So what finally motivates the doctor to do the skin biopsy? Well, every doctor and practitioner is different. Um, <laughs> So when you're a physician or any practitioner, you want to you want to balance between, um, of course, we want to test people, but we don't want, we don't want to over test people or put people through too many procedures. Um, so there's that that one overarching desire as a doctor, we don't want to do harm. And even though skin biopsies are pretty benign, they are a procedure. They hurt. They will leave a scar. Um, you know, when we teach dermatologists and doctors about how to look out for CTCL. You know, because CTCL can mimic other normal uh, benign rashes, we always say if it's not getting better or if there's atypical unusual features that are different than the typical presentation. So not getting better and something weird about it, as Dr. Um, Hodak mentioned. So not getting better, getting worse, and something unusual. Right. And then also, there, you know, there are patients that undergo biopsies over time, like in the setting of maybe parasoriasis. You know, you might have had a biopsy one year and then a biopsy two years later. And it's usually when sort of the behavior of the disease looks different to the clinician. So that's the beauty of if you happen to stick with the same dermatologist over time rather than going from dermatologist to dermatologist, they can kind of see the behavior of the disease and the fact that it didn't respond to in the predictable fashion to the treatment, then that oftentimes sort of propels people to say, I need, a, you know, I need another look-see here. I need to look under the microscope again. And then the other comment about skin biopsies is oftentimes they're not gratifying. Um, and for patients over time, the diagnosis is not n nailed immediately. There may be atypical cells under the microscope, but really not enough of them to meet criteria for cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, so that those patients may be over time, once again, with hopefully the same set of eyes looking at them and sort of, you know, sort of paying attention to their disease over time would repeat the skin biopsy. And then one day, oftentimes, and I'm sure for many people in the room, the biopsy sort of fit with the clinical picture and a diagnosis is made. Coming over here. So for about four years, I was in dermatologists, um, emergency rooms, having UTIs, which is completely different scenarios, um, some kind of colds, and have a lifetime prescription from fungal creams. And I was in antibiotics, uh, all kinds of antibiotics, um, developed a kind of resistance to tons of you know, strength, um, steroids, non-stop until it got to the point that the insurance company called the nurse and asked what's going on. Five different creams for one for the head, one from the hand, one for the, and how can somebody have a long-term ringworm, you know, diagnosis? Why we have to go through this? Well, I, so your story um, sort of represents maybe many people's worst fears of just going years and years with symptoms and diagnosis um, and lots of doctors and lots of treatments but no unifying diagnosis and then when they finally figure it out it's it's more advanced or active and you just wonder why. Um, so I, 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 it's hard for me to directly address your particular situation because I don't have all the information but maybe I can uh, maybe I can comment on just the field in general. So stage 1A, so the average time for di to diagnosis for CTC, for mycosis fungoides cesare syndrome, all comers, all stages, is the average time from start of rash to diagnosis is six years. So all people in general, on average, it takes that long. And I talked about it a little bit in the introduction, I'm not sure if you were here, but it's one of the major frustrations of our field. And as I um, talked about, it's not, there are, there are about five different factors that contributed to it, okay? Um, and in some cases, which may be the case for you, is despite all the testing and treatment, your tests were non-diagnostic. And that can occur. Um, and some of it may be just the nature of the condition, it just takes a whole long time to declare itself. Um, 
and it, it can be true. So they've done formal studies, like in Cesare syndrome, so I, I don't know if Dr. Horowitz mentioned this, but one-third of Cesare syndrome patients, their skin biopsies are non-diagnostic. Even when they're finally diagnosed, they're diagnosed with a blood test or a lymph node biopsy. So that's a lot of Cesare patients whose skin biopsies, even when they're diagnosed, still don't show the answer. It's looking in the blood or the lymph node. So that's one issue. And also, we don't know how long you were in sort of maybe a precancerous state that was just brewing, 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 and then finally evolved. But nonetheless, it's, I, I'm glad that they're getting closer to an answer. Um, I think that um, you, sounds like you found the right people to try to put it all together. Um, I think that one thing I'm humbled by is that sometimes, even at specialty centers, it takes a, a while to diagnose difficult cases, and you might be an unusual, particularly special case that just, you know, we're just not smart enough to figure it out right away, and we have to follow patients over time. Um, you know, so I'm sorry you had to go through that, but that does happen, unfortunately. Have you had any experience with oral mycosis fungoides in the oral cavity? So I guess this is the early stage form, um, yeah. but we're, <laughs> we're kind of talking about, I think everybody's mostly concerned, like what are the chances of it getting serious? So just to kind of back up a little bit. Oh, that's how I started. Yeah. And it never came, it never returned. Yeah. Well, so, so oral... Um, so, so again, early stage disease is when it's patches or plaques, less than 90% of your body. You could possibly have a little bit enlarged lymph nodes, but lymphoma is not on the lymph nodes. Um, and that's 70% of CTCL patients, okay? In terms of progression, about, I usually tell patients between 10 and 20% can progress to a higher stage. Higher stage may be still just in the skin, Higher stage does not necessarily mean internally, you know, in the blood or lymph nodes or organs, but we do have some patients who progress to serious disease, life-threatening disease, so I'm not going to lie, that does happen. But that probably occurs, I generally say all comers, you know, 5% of early stage patients progress to serious life-threatening disease internally. Well, so oral mycosis fungoides usually is not a good sign. Some people consider that puts you up to stage four if it involves your muc oral mucosa in your mouth or your tongue. Have I had patients with that? Yes. And if they really have it, it really is a more serious sign of disease, and they often have it elsewhere in the lymph nodes, or they have tumors on the skin or internal involvement. One confusing thing is if you have lymphomatoid papulosis, which you may have, given what you <coughs> commented on before, you can get lymphomatoid papulosis in the mouth. And it will go away on its own after a couple weeks or months. It can reach up to two centimeters in size, but that's lymphomatoid papulosis, and that has better prognosis. And that can look similar under the microscope to mycosis fungoides, as we alluded to. So, um, and 5% of mycosis fungoides patients can have lymphomatoid papulosis. So those two things can go together. My question was related to her, um, whether or not the, the addition of Cesare syndrome will cause them to restage, um, to give her a different stage, I guess, if that makes sense. Well, if you were really stage 1A at the beginning of all this, which sounds like it's maybe still yet to be determined, um, then that would be progression to um, stage 4 disease or Cesare syndrome. So, to for disease because of the blood involvement. So when there's, uh, when the flow cytometry is done and there's um, a, an abnormal circulating blood component that typically would prompt the team to, you know, want to do things like staging scans, which it sounds like you had, and moving on to a, a biopsy of an area of concern. So that would be progression from if you indeed had a diagnosis that was sort of clear cut at the beginning of 1A. And it sounds like your, your situation is a little um, uncertain. I don't know if this seems simplistic at all, but I hear a lot of talk.
talk about uh, skin care, um, but don't often understand what that means as far as for, for the disease, what's good skin care. Um, I'm a guy. <laughs> skin care to me is washing periodically. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so just if you could uh, talk about that a little, please. Yeah, so, bear, you know, your largest organ in the body. Um, but, you know, barrier function, you know, uh, by definition, patients with cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, particularly patients that are maybe a little bit greater than stage 1A, um, and certainly patients uh, with tumor stage disease are at greater risk for infections. So, per, you know, sort of preserving your barrier function and um, how do you do it? You wash and you soak and you seal. So you, you hydrate your skin with moisturizers after um, your, you shower um, and clean your skin. Um, for some patients, that's the time that they use their topical corticosteroids because you get better penetration of the steroid molecule when your skin is well hydrated, so that for timing, if you are prescribed topical steroids, you usually do quite better, get more bang for your buck if you use them after you've hydrated your skin. Um, so infection risk for patients who have poor barrier function, so we're scratching a lot, and we haven't even talked about itching, which is amazing, because for a lot of patients, that's sort of the hallmark of the disease that gets you into the dermatology office is itching. Um, but because we scratch, we you know break down our barrier, and that puts us at risk for secondary infections. And think about all the things that are out there when we just sort of leave our homes, bacteria, uh, fungi, or, or viral things. So preserving function, barrier function, keeping your skin sealed is really important. And I and I understand it's really tough for the guys. I you know they come in and. Um, they usually lo look a bit uh, more dry than a lot of my uh, women. When you talk about um, creams or lotion, like what type? There's so many things. That are, I mean, I can't recommend a brand, but are there things you should avoid that are in them? Uh, I'm a school teacher, so avoiding um, bad things is hard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I usually um, recommend, and I don't know what, what Ellen thinks, but I oftentimes tell people to turn a bottle over and take a look at all of the ingredients. So if you have a shorter list, you know you're probably in better shape. So the less additives, the less constituents, and, and moisturizers like you know, you know, Aquaphor or CeraVe, things like that, I think are uh, you know, uh, for patients that have that long-term history of maybe I had atopic dermatitis. There was a gentleman in the room who had a lifelong history of rash. That if you lesser ingredients in the bottle, the better. And the drier your skin, the more ointment-like, uh, the more oil-based, the better the hydration you get. Um, so if you're really dry, the oilier uh, you want to go for a vehicle when you select agents. Yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree. I think uh, for our patients with MF um, and Cesare, about 90% of them will notice that they will experience more disease activity or their patches, plaques feel worse or they're itchier once the seasons change, yeah. you know, particularly yeah. once um, fall kicks in or especially like in Philadelphia, once January rolls around, we actually get actual cold weather and people start turning on their heat at home so it can get very dry. And so decreased humidity, decreased ambient light and sunlight, those can, tr can contribute to minor or mi mild or moderate flares mm -hmm. that require moisturizing more. That can be helpful, having a humidifier at home, you know, staying hydrated, drinking enough water, avoiding like itchy clothes, like, you know, things that irritate your skin. So try to avoid too many like perfumey things or... And lanolin, lan lanolin can be tough for a lot of people too. And then the other thing is, um, um, oh, infections in the skin and sort of reducing infections. And I'm sure many people in the room have been recommended dilute bleach baths. And for a lot of patients that are at risk for um, secondary infections because they have so much uh, barrier skin breakdown, um, we have patients do bleach baths to so sort of decrease the uh, uh, potential for colonizing bacteria on your skin. I I, I do a very dilute, like a third of a cup in a, um, a question. We're warm just going to have I've got the I got the two minute warning. Okay. Hi. So when I first. Um, got sick uh, about five years ago. I had a, a very large, I'm stage 1A, very large lesion. It was massive. Um, and I got diagnosed right away. Uh, and I started the narrowband UVB treatment after the topical steroids stopped working after a year. Uh, but what I've noticed, um, and it's working great, I'm pretty much clear. Uh, but what I have noticed on myself is the first lesion I got, which was in the, the, the buttocks and thigh area, um, was very placky. 
and the narrow band UVB brought out the you know the hidden, and it came out very different. It was more like erythemia. Um, am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's common. Uh, that the the patches, the plaques could look different. They could present themselves differently. They can. Um, so patches are defined as just you know um, blotchy rashes. They sometimes can be scaly, but they often don't have much substance. Um, and then plaques are when they're raised. Like when you close your eyes, you can actually feel that they're raised above the normal skin. Um, so patches and plaques can look a little different from each other. And also a patch or plaque that's been there for a little while will look different than something that's pretty new. So some patients will get new patches and they, they're not sure if it's their MRF or not. Um, and they'll be a little worried like, oh, is it or is it not? So my rule of thumb is generally, again, because we're dealing with mostly early stage disease, if you have a patch, you're not sure if it's new, you know, you can keep an eye on it for two weeks, moisturize it. Um, if it persists longer than that, then it may be a manifestation of the condition. Again, if you're less than 10% body surface area or even like less than, you know, 50% body surface area, you're still staying within early stage disease, uh, but then you can bring it to the attention of your, you know, your provider. Yeah, I too use the two week mark so that people don't panic every time they get a blotch because in life we all get blotches. The other thing about phototherapy I just wanted to comment on, and, and with a lot of the therapies with topical nitrogen mustard as well, you'll sometimes see a little bit of disease brought to the forefront when you start therapy. So it wasn't there and now it's there. And I think patients need to be prepared as they embark on these therapies that you know the cells are kind of presenting themselves. So you may have a little bit of a flare, but it does give you more direction for you know where you really need treatment. So that's not, not uncommon. I have, a, I have a hypothetical. If you're, if you're a MF 1A and you're undiagnosed your whole life, if I heard you right, you, if 95% never progressed to 2A or any advanced stage, mm -hmm. you could live 1A untreated your entire life. So I had just a patient um, two weeks ago who had the rash for 40 years before he was diagnosed. He remembered it. 40 years previous and one wasn't a 1A of 1A um, he was not itchy it was hidden under his underwear um, so he never basically saw it it didn't bother him or his wife um, and so he kind of just chalked it up to dry skin so uh, there are patients who give a very very long history and that just is an example of how indolent or slow moving some early stage disease can be so it does raise the question, you're, I can see that you're, you're thinking a step ahead, like do we really have to treat early stage mm -hmm. disease um, in all patients? And I would say that, um, first of all, there's no formal guidelines, so you won't see anything on the NCCN guidelines offering you know, active surveillance. Mm -hmm. um, you, you basically have to take direction from your provider because your provider is going to also take other things into account about your unique medical situation and what they observe on your skin and your other medical problems, you know, to, to give you a formal recommendation for that. Okay, but I can tell you, at least in my practice, I do think there's a subset of early stage patients who have thin patches, who are not itchy who've never had infection, and who tell me that they've had the disease for many years and it's just kind of sitting there, and who's a reliable patient who follows up with me regularly, I can say yes, we can partner in active surveillance because there are some low-grade cancers out there like prostate cancer, early prostate cancer for some patients, thyroid cancer for some patients, CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia for low-burden tumor patients where active surveillance is an acceptable mode of treatment plan. So that, that does exist in medicine, but it has to be decided between you and your doctor, not by me. Uh, first, I wanted to say, Dr. Kim is my doctor, and I have to say, <laughs> she is fabulous. She was definitely the calm in a storm when I was diagnosed with FMF in January of 2014. Um, she was so calm and was able to walk me through and 
the way she is right now, just kind of calmly breathing and just answering the questions, it was fabulous for me because I was in a panic. Okay, now my question, it's not actually a, a question uh, for the doctor, but I guess for everybody. Um, so I have FMF, and even when my skin is clear, um, I'm not having flare-ups, my skin isn't dry, it's well hydrated, all of that. Sometimes I'll just wake up in the morning and I'll just feel like overly lethargic and just kind of crappy. And my skin just hurts. Like you don't want to drag on any clothing or anything. And I'm wondering if other um, MF or FMF patients have that same experience where there's not really flare-ups, it's just you're uncomfortable in your own skin and you don't really know how to fix it, and then it kind of goes away by the end of the day. Just curious. What's FMF? Molecular-trophic mycosis fungoides. So it's a specific variant of mycosis fung. Right. Okay, any comments to that? Oh, I, I think you were looking to see if other patients had similar experience. Yeah. I don't think, I personally don't feel like any um, sort of reported information I get from patients is just in their head. It's their experience with the disease. So, and particularly when there's a follicular component or the hair follicles involved to have some sensation that's not quite what was considered to be normal for you in a past time, I don't think is unusual. Fatigue, you know, I, I look at how people spend their, t it, the disease itself, uh, the treatments we're imposing and managing that with your day-to-day -day life and your quality of life. So therapies alone can produce um, fatigue, even skin-directed therapies over time. So I think it's real. Okay, we're going to do one more question. Okay, yeah, because we have to. Yeah. Ah, so you guys should talk. You guys have to sit at the same you lunch table. You should sit at the same <laughs> lunch table. <laughs> I just want to say that one thing I've learned is that all pathologists are not the same. I mean, I, I really, I'm sitting here and I'm listening, and I was looking at the slides of the bloods, and it really is scary to think that when you, have, when you send your slides uh, to the pathologist, I mean, you're in the hands of someone who's making decisions uh, about the, the course of your life. I mean, I, I, nobody's really addressed that, and I, I, I've had a couple of different uh, pathology, pathology reports from different hospitals, and it's amazing. Yeah, and it, it's a difficult job, I think, for the pathologists in many cases of um, um, MF or, 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 or certainly in Cesare syndrome to call the diagnosis, and I think that's where there has to be a relationship between the person who's completing that pathology report who has examined you and sharing that information so that there's a clinical there's a clinical correlation made with the pathology so that the, the two the two parties speak um, because they need the backstory um, I think and also I think keep in mind that remember a skin biopsy is just a teeny tiny portion of your entire skin rash it's like a small sample so that's one of the problems. Um, these are also sometimes extremely challenging cases. Like even at the specialty centers, um, if you take two very good dermatopathologists, hematopathologists, they might not always 100% agree on the subtype. So that's why we have, you know, when you, when you, if you get diagnosed with um, a, a cutaneous lymphoma, it's good to get referred to a, a specialty center, especially if it's a kind of not straightforward case. They will review your slides. Um, at their what they call tumor board consensus conference and um, sometimes the pathologist said please get another biopsy <laughs> that's very that's pretty common where they say please get us more tissue because it's just too hard and then finally you know again the final diagnosis sometimes takes multiple um, you know kind of conferences between the clinician and the pathologist so what we call clin path correlation to make sense of it all because it, it is just very, and I think your particular case, since you alluded to it before about the different aspects, just as one of the examples of, of, of you need people to, to make that clin path correlation. Yeah.